Hello everyone. This video is on section 9.1 titled Solving Quadratic Equations Using the Square Root Property. All right, so in this video I'm going to be going over a version of the Newton-Alta assignment for section 9.1. Now please understand that the questions I'm seeing in this version of the assignment you know, may or may not be the exact same questions that you see when you work on the assignment yourself. But the objectives are the same, the types of questions are similar, so I'm hoping that watching me do this here uh, helps you in some way when you're working on the assignment on your own. Alright, so here's the assignment page. You see, uh, you won't be seeing the words preview of, that's just for me. You'll just see the title of the assignment, and then you have your mastery bar telling you how far along you've gotten. Your objectives, looks like there are two objectives in this particular assignment. And then beneath each objective, you know, the current objective, you have questions. In every question box at the bottom, you should see a feedback button, right, which you can send feedback to Newton through. You will not see the instructor cheat button. Right? This is for instructors only. But you will see a more instruction button, which I highly recommend use of. Click on the more instruction button, and you'll be provided with you know further reading material, or videos, or both. Uh, that will hopefully help you uh, in dealing with questions related to a certain objective. Okay, um, so the first question here is on the objective solve quadratic equations using the square root property. Alright, so first I want to talk about you know what the square root property is and I'll also you know, write this equation out and it's just like any other equation you know we're trying to solve it trying to find values I can replace the variable with to make a true statement only now um, if you recall section 8.8 .8, we were introduced to inter I imaginary numbers, right? Square roots of negatives written as an imaginary number, right? Some real number times i, where i was the square root of negative one. Uh, we will be expressing solutions now, either as real numbers, purely imaginary numbers, or you know, a combination of both. All right. So I'll write this equation out and we'll go to a separate page and talk about the square root property. Alright, so we're asked to solve, you know, 6c squared equals negative 18. Right, using this thing they're calling the square root property. Now the square root property just st states this. If I have some expression squared, and I'll just make a big x to the second power, if this is equal to a constant, right, I'll say n for a number. Right, so you have uh, on the left side, uh, on one side you have an expression with variables to the second power. Expression with a variable raised to the second power. On the other side of the equal sign we have just a number no variables, right? a constant. Okay, no variables, and that's key in order to be, to be able to use this square root property in this particular assignment. 
All right, well, if we have some expression squared equal to a constant, then this expression that's being squared is equivalent to the principal square root of that constant or the expression that's being squared, right, the x, is the negative square root or the opposite of the principal square root of that constant. So we're going to use this concept here to help us in finding solutions to certain quadratic equations, right? equations where the highest power on the variable is a second power. All right. So when solving an equation like this, you know, 6 times c squared equals negative 18, notice that the variable c is in a square, right, c squared, and there is no variable outside that square. Right? There's no like 5c or 18c over here. There's a variable in a square, and then no variable outside that square. And then what I'm going to be doing with these equations, where there's a variable inside a square, and no variable outside that square, is to isolate the square. Isolate the square. Get, get this equation to be in this form from the square root property that I've written, where I have something squared, something with a variable squared, equals something without a variable, right? a constant, a number. Now for this particular equation, all I would have to do is divide by 6. And we'd have c squared equals you know, negative 3, negative 18 divided by 6. Now I have what I want. I have you know something with a variable squared on one side equals and then a constant, right? Some number without a variable on the other. And then by the square root property, right, by that square root property, C is either or the expression being squared is either the principal square root of negative 3 or c is, you know, negative square root, the opposite of the principal square root of negative 3. And these are our solutions here, right? The c is already solved for, right? c is already alone. And there we go, right? We have our solutions. Now don't forget when we see square roots of negatives now, we're going to be rewriting them as they're, you know, what they are. They're imaginary numbers. All right, if you recall, square roots, even roots of negative numbers are not real. They're imaginary, and I'm going to be writing them as imaginary numbers, as a real number times i. So my solutions here are c equals, you know, the square root of negative 3 is the square root of positive 3, right, a real number, times i. Remember what, what we did this in section 8.8. .8. Also, c equals, you know, negative square root of negative 3. Well, again, square, anytime you see the square root of a negative now, we're rewriting it as an imaginary. So it's negative square root of 3 times i, and just make sure the i is not inside the square root anymore. And here are the solutions of our equation. Right. And uh, you know, don't forget to check. Right, don't forget to check the solutions. So if I was to go back to the original equation, We have 6 times c squared equals negative 18. Well, if I let c be square root of 3 times i, and then square that, right, this is 6 times c squared, 
is this equal to negative 18? Now let's see. If I square this, we have 6 times, you know, the square root of 3 squared is 3. i squared is, you know, i squared. But remember, i is that square root of negative 1, right, the imaginary unit. So i squared, whenever you see that, is just negative 1. So I have 6 times 3 times negative 1. That is indeed negative 18. And I get negative 18 equals negative 18. It works. And the same would go for the other one. Negative square root of 3. If you did negative square root of 3i squared, you know, that would be positive 3i squared, which would be negative 3 times 6. You'd have negative 18 equals negative 18. Again, both of these work out. Both of those are valid solutions to our initial equation. But this is what we're doing. All right, we are isolating the square, the expression with a variable squared, and then on the other side there should be just a constant, and then we apply this square root property and state our solutions, and of course check back in the original equation. Now I'm going to leave it to you to check the solutions for these uh, exercises I'm doing here. As I know, if I'm if I do everything right, uh, they should work out. All right, so these are what I'm going to enter. Right? And they say if there are multiple solutions, you know, separate them with a comma. So c equals you know the square root of three, and then get out of there times i. Or you can put the i in the front of the radical to make it i times the square root of three. Same thing. Comma and then negative square root of three and get out of there times i. Right? Two imaginary solutions to this equation. Great. Then uh, after every question, right, whether you get it correct or incorrect, you should be seeing an answer explanation. I would highly recommend reading through these answer explanations. Now if you got it right, you know, read through them just to make sure you got it right for the right reasons, that you didn't just get lucky. Um, also, you know, they, they may do it in some alternate method that you like better and can use in future questions. Now, of course, if you got it wrong, definitely read through the answer explanations, right, and try to figure out where you went wrong, why you were wrong. Hopefully you can learn from your mistakes and then do better in the future. Alright, so moving on here. So this is on the other objective. Uh, solve quadratic equations with a binomial as the quadratic term, right? The term that's being squared, quadratic term, using the square root property. So again, we're asked to solve an equation uh, where the, you know there's a square, some quantity, some some expression with variables squared, and if there are multiple answers, you know, separate them with commas. Right. Now this is really no different than the first problem I did, the first question. Uh, the only thing that's going to change is there's going to be one more step at the end uh, to get the variable alone, and you'll see that when I write it out and work on it. All right, so we're solving this for q. Now we have this quantity, q plus 5 fourths squared. Uh, then outside the square, we have plus 7 you know, equals negative 18. So as I said with the first equation, the first question, right, you have this expression with a variable being squared. Only now it's not just q squared, it's, you know, it's an entire, you know, a binomial, there's multiple terms. But still, there is an expression with a variable being squared, and then everything else doesn't have that variable, right? The plus 7, the minus 18, those don't have q attached. So once again, I have a variable in a square, and no variables outside that square. So that's an indication that I can solve this with the square root property. All right, so like with the first question, I wish to I'll isolate the square. 
So to do that, I would just have to subtract 7. All right, so then we have this quantity, q plus 5 fourths squared is equal to, you know, negative 25. And I have what I want from that square root property, right, the, the beginning of it. All right, let me just bring that back here. Remember the square root property I wrote out, right? I have an expression squared equal to some number. Same thing here. So then using the square root property, right, and I'm going to stop, stop writing square root property after this question. But then using the square root property, you know, the, the expression being squared then, right, q plus 5 fourths, is either equal to the, you know, the principal square root of negative 25, or q plus 5 fourths is equal to the negative square root, or the opposite of the principal square root of negative 25. All right, just again, just applying this where, you know, x over here is q plus 5 fourths and n is negative 25, just applying this square root property to this equation. Now the square root of negative 25, remember a square root of a negative, we're going to rewrite as, you know, some real number times i as an imaginary number. Well, that would be 5i. 5 times i, right? This it would be the square root of positive 25, which is 5, times i. And then this negative square root of negative 25 is just, you know, negative 5i, negative 5 times i. And then I solve these for q. All right, that's, that's the only difference between this equation and the first one I was looking at, the first question. See, now that I've applied the square root property, you know, q, q is not alone in either of these. I would need to subtract 5 fourths from both sides. So from the fir for the first equation there, I get q equals, you know, negative 5 fourths, then plus 5i. And remember, these don't go together. You know, negative 5 fourths is a real number. 5i is an imaginary number. These don't get put together. And there's it. That's one solution. Or, you know, q equals, again, same thing down here. I would have to subtract 5 fourths from both sides. That would give me on the other side here negative 5 fourths. And then you have the minus 5i. And there we go. And then, of course, I would leave it to you to check these solutions. Don't forget to check them, but I'm telling you right now, I know I'm doing everything right here. They, they should work. Replace Q with these numbers back in the original equation. Now, an alternate way to write this. Notice how both of these terms here are just conjugates. Right, Q is negative 5 fourths plus 5i, that's one solution. And the other solution is its conjugate, negative 5 fourths minus 5i. Very often, you'll see the solutions written this way. You know, the, the solutions to this equation are negative 5 fourths, and then with a plus or minus symbol, and then you got 5i. Right. This is the same thing. All right, this ex what I just wrote here in this cloud, this bubble, uh, these are the same two numbers as these two, right? With the, the one with the plus, one with the minus. You'll see that happen quite often. If you have two expressions that are similar except for one sign, you know, a plus or minus sign, they'll just write that same expression, but you know, with the plus or minus sign where things change. But we are asked to, you know, enter separate values here. All right, we're asked to enter separate values separated by commas. All right, so back on the assignment, all right, one solution is uh, negative 5 fourths, then plus 5i, and then a comma. All right, 
put a comma, and then the other solution, negative 5 fourths, then minus 5i. They want us to use, you know, separate multiple values with commas in the instructions. Wonderful. And again, please read through the answer explanations. Okay. Same thing here, same objective. So I'll write this out and write out our solution steps. Okay. So it's already set up the way I wish, right? I have the quantity with the variable squared on one side, and then just a constant, right? Just a number, no variables on the other side. So then by that square root property, this expression being squared, right, z plus 4 thirds is going to be either equal to, now here's where you can put both of those little equations together and say z plus 4 thirds is going to be either equal to the positive square root or negative square root of negative 3, right, the number on the other side there. So this is the same thing as writing those two separate equations, right? One with the plus, one with the minus. And as I've been saying, when we see square roots of negative numbers now, we're going to rewrite those as imaginaries. So this is plus or minus square root of 3, then times i, or i times the square root of 3. All right, and then all I have to do now is solve for z. Right. Uh, z is not alone yet. I would have to subtract 4 thirds. All right, so then to get z alone, we subtract 4 thirds. So I have z on the left. Then we have, we'd have negative 4 thirds on the right. And then you know, 1 with the plus, 1 with the minus, and then the square root of 3 times i. And here's a description of both solutions to this equation. And don't forget to check them, right? but they should work. But remember what this means, right? Saying negative 4 thirds plus or minus the square root of 3 times i, that, that's two solutions, right? One is z equals negative 4 thirds plus the square root of 3 times i. And then the other one is z equals negative 4 thirds with the minus, right? Negative 4 thirds minus the square root of 3 times i. And th this is what they want us to enter. Right, they're having us enter two separate values separated by a comma. All right, so back here, z equals you know, negative 4 thirds and then plus the square root of 3 times i, and then a comma. Again, make sure the i is not inside the square root. And then the other one is negative 4 thirds minus the square root of 3 times i. Wonderful. Okay, and again, please read through <coughs> your answer explanations. All right, moving on. All right, now we're back to where we just have, you know, the single variable squared. But notice again, you have the variable in the square, and that variable doesn't appear outside that square. So that's, that's the indication that we can solve it using the square root property. Alright, right, so once again I'd like to isolate the square. All right, you have z squared here. <clears throat> so I'm going to get rid of the 2. All right, divide both sides by 2. z squared uh, must be equal to 5 then. Now notice that that's positive 5, right? So far in all the examples in this video so far, the number on the other side has been negative, but now it's positive. 
and when we take the square root of a positive number we just leave it that's that's the way it is it's it's a real number not imaginary so this equation is going to have some just you know real number solutions all right by the zero product property sorry not the zero product property the square root property uh, z is either going to be equal to positive or negative square root of 5. And that's it. Z is alone, right? I don't have to do anything else. The variable is solved for. And here are our two solutions. One is Z equals positive square root of 5. And the other one is Z equals negative square root of 5. But once again, you know, we have to separate those, right? They want us to write them as separate answers. So z equals positive square root of 5. The other one is z equals negative square root of 5. And here's what they want us to enter, separated by a comma. <coughs> Pardon me. Right, so yeah, square root of 5, get out of there, comma, and then negative square root of 5. Very simple, that one. But yeah, no imaginaries there. We took square roots of negative numbers, not square uh, square roots. Of, we took square roots of positive numbers, right? Not square roots of negatives. And once again, please read through the answer explanations. All right, next question, very similar. Um, in fact, I'll just go to the same piece of paper and do it on the other on the other half. So the equation we're given here is 3 times d squared equals negative 15. So, yeah, so isolate the square, right, divide by 3. We'll have d squared equals you know, negative 5. So now I will have imaginaries, right? The only way a square can be negative is if you have an imaginary number. Right, then by that square root property, d will either be equal to positive or negative um, square root of negative 5. But remember, square root of negative 5 is, re we're going to rewrite that as the square root of 5 times i, right, where i is that imaginary unit, that square root of negative 1. So here are our solutions, right? d, d is already solved for. And once again, they're asking us to, you know, write the two separate, you know, this is actually, uh, yeah, I use the plus or minus symbol, there's only one line here, but it really represents two solutions. One is just the square root of 5 times i, and the other one is, you know, negative square root of 5 times i. And this is what we want to enter with a comma separating them. So, square root of 5, get out of there, times i, comma, and then negative square root of 5, get out of there, and then times i. Right. Great. So yeah, hopefully after watching a few of these, these, these seem simple enough. And one more like this. Alright, but uh-oh, well, there's fractions involved. Now you can do this in multiple ways, you know. Um, I'm going to do the thing where I multiply both sides by the least common denominator. Uh, that'll just get rid of the fractions. Now you can keep the fractions where they are, but you'll see. All right, so let's uh, pull up a new piece of paper, write this out. We have y squared, right, divided by 4, plus 100 equals 201 divided by 2. Right, so the LCD, you know, and you can do this anytime there's denominators in, a, in an equation. Find the least common denominator, right, the LCD. The LCD here would be 4, right? And then just multiply both sides by the LCD, 
and that should get rid of all the denominators, right? Because all the denominators should go into the LCD evenly. Now be careful, right? You know, the, the left side has multiple terms. So I'm going to be distributing the 4 right, to those multiple terms. So the first term there, the 4s would cancel. You'd be left with just y squared plus, and then 4 times 100 is you know, 400 equals, and then on the right side, you know, 2 goes into 4 twice, so if those cancel, it becomes a 2, and then 201 times 2 would be 402. Alright, and now it's even easier to look at. Right, y squared plus 400 equals 402. And then I'd like to get it so I can use the, the square root property, right? Isolate the square, get the y squared alone, subtract 400. All right, we have, so we have y squared equals 2, and then I can use the square root property and say, oh, y must be either positive or negative square root of 2. And that's a square root of a positive number. Those are real. And there we go. So positive square root of 2 and negative square root of 2 are the two solutions that I'll be separating by a comma back in the assignment. So y equals you know, square root of 2, not 32, comma, and then negative square root of 2. Okay. Wonderful. All right, so that objective's over, where it was just a single variable squared. Uh, and now we're going to finish off with questions where there's a binomial squared. There's you know, a, a, an expression with variables, but there's multiple terms squared. All right. Hmm. All right. This one is annoying. And I'll explain why. All right, because you can solve this very easily without the square root property. And you, first of all, you can't use the square root property to start. And I'll, I'll talk about it. Let me write this out, and I'll bring it up. This, this might take a bit. All right. So see how there's a variable in a square, right? X squared. But then there's a variable outside a square. Variable outside the square. And if that's the case, then I can't use I can't use the square root property as is. So that means I have to like manipulate the equation in some way, rewrite it in some way, so I can use the square root property. Now, here's what I'm thinking they're trying to get you to see. If you were to factor this polynomial on the right on the left side here, 4x squared minus 12x plus 9, you would see that you'd get 2x minus 3 squared. There, there is your binomial to the second power. Right. So yeah, if you were to factor 4x squared minus 12x plus 9, you'd get 2x minus 3, you know, times 2x minus 3 again. All right, so now I have, now I have it looking in a form where I can, now, now I can use the square root property. because I have a, an expression with a variable s squared. There's a variable inside a square, and then outside that square, there are no variables. All right. There are no variables outside the square. So I can use the square root property. And then by the square root property, this 2x minus 3 
must be equal to, you know, positive square root of 9 or 2x minus 3 must be equal to, you know, negative square root of 9 or negative 3. Because right, 3 squared is 9, negative 3 squared is also 9. And then I solve each of these for x. Right. Now over here, x equals 3. Here, x equals 0. There's your solutions. Right. Add 3, divide by 2. Here, add 3, divide by 2 also, but you get 0. And check them, right? You know, when x equals 0, it's obvious, right? 0 minus 0 plus 9 equals 9, that's true. When x equals 3, you, know, you got 36 minus 36 is 0, and then plus 9 is 9, that's true as well. Both of these work. Yeah, so this one was a little trickier because the way it looked in the beginning, you couldn't use the square root property. There was a variable outside of a square. But if you factor the polynomial, then you have an equation where there's a variable in a square and no variable outside the square, and then you can apply the square root property. All right, great. Now, there is an alternate way you could have done this as well, which would probably be much easier, but I just, you know, they, they, they're trying to get you to use the square root property here in this section. But if I were to subtract nine from both sides, we'd end up with 4x squared minus 12x equals 0. <clears throat> right? If I subtract 9 from both sides. And then I can factor out a 4x from this, and then you have 4x times x minus 3 equals 0, and then you can tell by the zero product property that 0 is a solution, because x is a factor, and then you know 3 is a solution. So either way you did it, you would have ended up with 0 or 3 as solutions. But I'm trying to stick to this first way here so that we say, hey, well, when can I use the square root property or not? All right, so back here, now x equals, I'll put 0, comma, 3. Right? Those are the two solutions. And I should have just one more question here. Right, and this one's already set up real nice where I can use the square root property right away. So yeah, like I said, it's already set up to where I can use the square root property now, right? You have a variable expression in a square, no variables outside that square, right? There's no A anywhere else besides inside the square. And it's already set up so that I have my expression squared on one side and a constant on the other. Right? So I can apply that square root property right now and say, hey, you know, 4a minus 8 must be equal to, you know, either positive or negative. Square root of negative 64, now remember the square root of negative 64 we're going to rewrite as 8i, right? The square root of po the square root of positive 64, which is 8 times i. Okay. All right, and then uh, I want to solve for a. All right. So first, I'll add 8. You get 4a equals you know 8. I usually like putting the real numbers first and then the imaginary numbers. So plus 8. And then plus or minus, you know, one is a plus, one is a minus, 8i. And then I would divide everything by 4. And so a equals, now 8 divided by 4 is 2, plus or minus, and then 8i divided by 4. Again, 8 divided by 4 is 2, so that'd be 2i. And there you go. And, you know, if you can, you can check them if you wish, but the solutions to this equation are a equals, you know, 2 plus 2i. And the other solution is 2 minus 2i, right? And we're going to separate that by commas. So yeah, one solution is 2 plus 2i, comma, 2 minus 2i. And that's it. Wonderful. All right, and uh, yeah, so again, 
all about the square root property and you know when it can be used in this particular assignment and it can only be used this square root property when you have a variable expression inside a square on one side and then just a constant no variables on the other side that's the only time it can be used All right, and then please read through your answer explanations right I think I already said that anyway all right, so uh, that should be it for this version of this assignment. And as I said at the top of the video, please understand that the questions I saw here might not be the questions that you see, but the objectives are the same. The types of questions are similar; going to be similar. Right, so how you, how you would go about working on them would be similar. And I'm hoping that watching me go over these eight questions here, you know, helps you in some way when you're working on the assignment on your own. And thank you very much for watching.